When you hear NVMe, what do you think of? Probably this, right? Yeah, makes sense. This is an M.2 NVMe drive, but this is also an NVMe drive, a U.2 NVMe drive. While most of you might think of these little gum stick sized drives in the enterprise and small to medium sized businesses, NVMe means a whole lot more. So why do these exist? What do they do differently than these? That's what I wanted to find out when ASRock sent me an enterprise grade server that is designed to hold 12 of these U.2 NVMe drives. Immediately, you'll notice that these are bigger, and upon further inspection, you'll see that the connection is different as well. Why? Why not just use M.2 drives? I mean, think of how many you could fit of these into the same space that you could fit 12 of these. Well, before we get into that, we need to explain what NVMe is. NVMe, or Non-Volatile Memory Express, is a standard designed for storage devices to be able to communicate on the PCIe protocol. Okay, what does that actually mean? Basically, it means that storage devices can transfer data very fast, way faster than the more common SATA or SAS standards. Also, PCIe is just a more flexible, more future-proof way to connect devices. Now, prior to 2011, we just had SATA and SAS, which is plenty fast enough for spinning drives and even early SATA SSDs. But we as a society needed to go faster and instead of sticking with a dated standard, we just hopped on the PCIe train and created NVMe. Now the first NVMe drives didn't look like either of these. They were basically adding cards that fit directly into the PCIe slots. And you can still find some of these today on the secondhand market. But as requirements got more demanding, we realized that we needed to get with the program on density as cramming a server full of add-in cards would quickly grow to obscene levels of space required. Manufacturers found out quickly though that it was pretty easy to modify those SATA or SAS standards to carry a PCIe signal. As technology advanced, we were able to fit faster flash storage into smaller packages, which is always good, right, fellas? So by 2015, companies like Samsung were like, hey, we already have this M.2 standard for really small SATA SSDs. Why don't we use that for the NVMe drives? And still today, the M.2 NVMe drive is the go-to standard for nearly every modern computer from laptops, mini PCs, and even ultra sweaty nerd gaming PCs. So again, I ask, why does this exist? Well, like M.2 is a physical standard, so is U.2 or U.3. I'll briefly talk about the difference in a bit. U.2 was created at the same time NVMe was back in 2011 and was designed specifically for the enterprise market for a few reasons. One was to provide a hot swappable standard for NVMe drives, because remember, at the time we didn't have M.2 yet, and to be fair, M.2 doesn't really lend itself too well to hot swappability. And two, U.2 was created to leverage the already existing two and a half and three and a half inch standard sizes for storage drives. I mean, if there's one thing that folks in the enterprise world don't like, it's change, because while it's fun for you and me to upgrade to cool new tech every year, when a company or manufacturer has millions of dollars worth of tooling hardware, they sure don't want to have to change anything. So yeah, U.2 has been around for longer than M.2, but they just aren't common in the consumer market. You may have heard of U.3, which you could probably guess is the successor to U.2, kind of. They both still utilize the PCIe interface, but U.3 expands that to support tri-mode controllers, which allow you to plug in a SATA, SAS, or U.2 NVMe drive into the same port. It's actually pretty cool. And like we mentioned, these U.2 drives give us the flexibility of keeping a standardized size and hot swappability, but also you can fit a shit ton more storage into these than their M.2 cousins. Look at this. This is a 60 terabyte NVMe drive. I've only ever seen eight terabyte on M.2. Okay, I lied, this isn't a 60 terabyte drive. I was trolled by Jordan from storageview.com, but these are currently shipping as real drives, even though he only sent me a 16 terabyte drive with an inkjet label. But that's still a lot of storage. But it's crazy to imagine that they are shipping these U.2 drives with up to 128 terabytes. And Jordan got a chance to take a look at some of those over at FMS 2024. So we can see that the demand for higher capacity storage at NVMe speeds is certainly there for the enterprise world. It's starting to make sense why these exist now, right? They're actually rolling out a new standard for NVMe drives these days, which kind of looks like a long, skinny, hot swappable power supply. Kind of crazy. 
And this doesn't even begin to touch on the different NAND technologies behind the NVMe protocol, SLC, TLC, QLC. What are these? Shopping channels that your Nana watches during the day? <laughs> So yeah, that was kind of a brief walkthrough on what U.2 is, why it exists, and why you don't really see it too often. But let's take a look at some of them because all U.2 drives are not created equal, famously said by Albert Einstein. And while Jordan is an absolute troll, he's also an absolute bro and sent over a bunch of U.2 NVMe drives for me to play around with. He sent quite a few, but there are six different models. The Intel P3700, Intel P4510, Western Digital SN640, Intel P5316, Solidime P5336, and a Memblaze PBlaze drive. I'm gonna see what kind of differences we see when running four different tests on each of them. Two of them are gonna be sequential reads and writes, which simulates transferring a large file to max out the bandwidth. And the other two are random read writes to simulate moving lots of small files to max out the IOPS or input output operations per second. The best way to think about the difference between bandwidth and IOPS is to think of moving files like moving cars. Bandwidth is gonna be how fast a car can go, while IOPS is gonna be how many cars you can move over time. So a sequential read-write test is like testing on a drag strip, while random read-write is like testing on a congested seven-lane interstate. I hope that made sense. Let's just show you the results. Here's a graph showing the sequential read performance of all of the drives during a 60-second test. You can see the results are pretty consistent for our top two performers, the Solidime P5336 and the Intel P5316 at nearly 7,000 megabytes per second. That's very fast. Now remember, if we are using our analogy from before, this is like sending a single race car down a drag strip, so a single large file read. We are seeing a bit different results for the other four drives where the Memblaze and the P4510 were just as steady, but slower at around 3000 megabytes per second. Then we have the P3700 and the Western Digital with some spikes up to 3000, but hovering around a lower speed for the most part. This could be due to some weird caching going on, but these four drives have a lower ceiling anyway, since they are PCIe Gen 3 drives, as opposed to the Gen 4 of our faster ones. Moving on to sequential writes is where we get some interesting results. Nearly all of the drives were consistently sitting at 2000 megabytes per second, except for the P5316, which was hovering between 3,000 and 4,000 megabytes per second. Again, not sure if this is a caching thing or if something's up with the drive. I mean, it has been through the ringer a little bit. This is pretty common in terms of sequential write speeds being a good bit lower than the reads, so I can accept these results. Moving on to the random tests, where the results are probably more in line with the line of enterprise workloads that these types of drives will be purchased for. For random reads, 4K block size with a high enough number of jobs in IO depth to saturate these drives, we saw pretty consistently high numbers across the board with similar latencies as well. The writes are a much different story though and may be the most important results to determine which drives you may need. You can clearly see that our two Gen 4 drives are easily the worst performers here with much lower IOPS than the other four, most likely due to the QLC NAND architecture. This is just the nature of some of these drives and the workloads they're designed for. In the consumer market, none of these tests really matter since they're going into a single system and running pretty normal workloads that won't really mimic what these tests are showing, but in the enterprise world, you have various different workloads from hosting tons of VMs to large databases to mass media storage and all kinds of stuff, each having their own sequential or random performance requirements. Like if we take a look at this graph showing random read performance over a different number of jobs in IO depths, that can show you that unless you have tons of users running specific workloads, you aren't gonna get those max IOPS. If you wanna know more about these kinds of numbers or see more comprehensive tests, then go check out storage review write-ups on any of these drives. They just have so much more info, but I'm trying to keep it as high level as possible, so that's outside the scope of this video. Here is a summary of the results from these tests, which goes to show you that it doesn't always come down to faster drive equals better. One thing we didn't even touch on was drive endurance, which is a pretty important attribute to choosing an enterprise drive because 
If you're writing a shitload of data, you want your drives to be able to last a long time. Now, obviously I'm not in a position where I can test that these drives will last five years with multiple drive writes per day. So all I can do is display that information here on these charts. I will say it was cool getting to play with so many different drives at the same time because it helps conceptualize the difference between them when you run the exact same tests on the exact same system and plot them next to each other. If I had to pick an overall winner, I guess I'd go with the P4510 as it performed consistently well across the board. The Solidime was great for sequential workloads if that's your jam though. I mean, this wasn't really a competition, more like a learning experience to kind of dip my toe into the world of high speed storage. Overall, I had a ton of fun with this video and I hope that you maybe learned a bit along the way. I'm well aware that we can go much deeper with the tests and explain the nuance between the different caching and NAND types, but I think this was good enough for our first video. A huge shout out to Jordan again. Go check out storageview.com and their YouTube channel for a bunch more insight into all of this. But that's what I have for this video. Let me know down in the comments what you want to see next. I do have to send all of these drives back to Jordan, but if you guys ask nicely down in the comments, maybe Solidime will send over some of their newer stuff. If you like this video, then drop a like and subscribe if you want to see more storage content. I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube members and my Patreons. You guys are my you got to drive array with just so much bandwidth and so many IOPS. Y'all are the best. And if you're still watching, you're a SATA hard drive. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in the next one.